Digital evangelism is really easy. Please remember to like, comment and share this video. Also, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. All these things give us favour with the YouTube algorithm and help our content to be seen by more people. God bless. So this is week six. Um, it, we've covered so much, it, I wouldn't really be able to go over the last six, five weeks in any, you know, detail. But we, you know, over the past five weeks have learned that Jesus came with the purpose of reestablishing re the kingdom lost by Adam and Eve and reconciling man to his creator. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, a kingdom that provides many rights and benefits and promises promises its citizens abundant life within that kingdom he established his church his governing body his church has been given a commission to train people to reign he endowed his church with many gifts and the greatest gift his spirit to empower them to fulfill this task task of the great commission sorry this does happen with my mouth sometimes um so but there is a pattern God has designed for us to follow. Unfortunately, this pattern has been abandoned. And the system of church that is rooted in Babylonish wisdom uh, can be found in many churches and organizations. The purpose of this study has been, has been and is to teach the kingdom perspective that we might restore that which has been lost god may be glorified and his will be done on the earth as it is in heaven so we have been on this particular topic for a few weeks the kingdom assignment of the church and we're going to go into detail uh this week as you've seen from the advert in um into evangelism and discipleship but i want to start with kingdom vision what do i mean by kingdom vision so in the secular world they have a meaning of what you know vision means and when i used to mentor um high school children i used to use some of this you know explanation for why they need a vision so when i would go into mentor a you know a young person i'd say you know, where do you see yourself in five years? And I don't think any one of them could really tell me with any great detail where they saw themselves. Like they wasn't, they, they just didn't look that far. And maybe that's because I was working mainly with, you know, children who were, I don't want to say troubled, didn't necessarily have, you know, uh, psychological problems, but they wasn't, you know, performing as they should. So I would uh ask them what they you know where they saw themselves in five years what they wanted to do and then I would explain to them you know the importance of having a vision and this is some of what I would read so I'd say I'll tell them a vision is the act or power of sensing with the eyes or its sight the act or power of anticipating that which will or may come to be so I would tell them a clear vision helps you pursue dreams and achieve goals a vision that is clear will open your mind to the endless possibilities of the future a vision will help you to overcome obstacles in the way and helps you hold on when times are tough a vision that is well defined helps you to focus and create a purpose that becomes your measurement for success if you do not have a vision of who you want to be or how you want to succeed or what you want out of life you begin to lack drive and your life just becomes an order of events. So that's what I would go through with these, um, you know, with these, with these uh, teenagers, and really try to explain to them why they need to start planning and having, you know, some vision for their life. So Hosea says, sorry, Hosea says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Proverbs also says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Now, that could also be translated, or the people are discouraged. 
So where there is no vision, people cast off restraint, they get wild, they do whatever, or people are discouraged. That's what the word says. So lack of knowledge, people are destroyed. And with no vision, people are discouraged. They cast off restraint. Right? So why is a vision for the church important with you know all of these things in mind? Well, I've pretty much explained it already, but does anybody want to give an example of why uh having a vision or why a church having a vision is important? And give me like an actual solid example other than just saying you know otherwise they don't know where they're going is there any examples that anybody can give mm, if you if if there is no vision um i mean obviously the the, the purpose of of a church is um everybody to be saved is the, the, the simple right. purpose and if there's no vision of, there has to be strategies I like that of how to do this. Strategy. There has to be strategies and the vision comes before the strategies. So you can't have a strategy if you don't have vision. And these are God-given strategies as well. You know, they're inspired by God. Wonderful. So, yeah, that was really... I love it. I, 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 the, I like the fact that you defined what comes first because god is orderly and there must be vision and and strategy so the vision for our lives and for our churches has already been meticulously mapped out by god if we do not tap into this vision or we do not renew our minds concerning god's vision in each season we will become disgruntled and stagnate david said in psalm 139 16 your eyes could see me as an embryo but in your book, all my days were already written. My days had been shaped before any of them existed. So if David can say that on an individual level, then we for sure know that God has a plan for our, our the institution of church that he, he established. So no vision equals no accountability. If we have no mark to reach and no goal to be attained, we have no measurement of success, which means we will always feel we are where we should be. This is the endless merry-go-round and limbo that the system of church has bound people in for hundreds of years. The scripture says, herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Whatever the church is doing, if it is not reproducing disciples, it is not fulfilling the master's will. So I've mentioned the system of church before. The system of church that is coming out of Catholicism, coming out of Babylon, keeps people in limbo. It keeps people in a building. It keeps people in a system, but it doesn't actually fulfill the Great Commission. So if the church is not producing or reproducing disciples, it cannot say that it is fulfilling the master's will. So the church must have a vision, as the Catherine said, and there must be some strategy with that vision. When a church has no vision from God or is trying to operate using an expired vision, a vision for a specific period and time, it will stagnate and die a slow death. This is what is happening to many of our churches today. May not be your church, but if you look around you, it's happening. It will create markers of success that are man-made and not biblical, such as number of baptisms and the amount who spoke in tongues. Forgetting the scripture says angels rejoice at repentance, not baptism. And the Bible says by their fruit, you will know them, not their tongues. This is what happens when churches have no vision and no strategy. They create markers of success that is, that's not biblical. I don't care how much people you baptize. How much of them have repented and how much of them are being discipled? I don't care how much of them spoke in tongues. Do they have fruit in their life? I don't care what man has created. I care what the Bible requires and what the Bible says is fruit and discipleship. So when you, when you have no biblical markers, you create markers. Oh, 100 people registered for this event. Who cares? 
what does the what does God expect? What does God want? He wants disciples. He doesn't want conformers. He wants disciples, disciplined followers. A church without a vision is like a bus without a route. It can look good, sound good, and seem to be heading to its destination. But after a while, the people inside will realize that the bus is not taking them to their intended destination and will be forced to make a decision about how they are going to reach their destination. Some will leave the bus to look for another. Some will look for other modes of transport. Some will decide to walk home. Others will wait inside in the hope that the bus will eventually take them where they want to go. And in this process, much time and many lives are wasted because those in charge of the bus did not plan a route. This is what happens to some churches. They start well and they had a vision for a period of time. But then after that vision is expired, because there has not been any progress, because there's not been really real discipleship, because sometimes the pastor wants to, to, to hand over the, the, the church to his, to his family, or because he hasn't raised up any other people to take over, the vision expires and they try to run on that old vision and it doesn't work. And people get frustrated and some leave, some go to other religions, some go to other churches. But in that process of time where the, 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 the leadership is figuring out what it needs to do, people are dying. People are not getting discipled. People are not, are not getting the nutrition they need. And this has got to stop because this is all because we have followed a system of church that is not biblical. I see a comment. Okay, that's a good question. How often should we expect a new vision from the leadership? I think that is a very good question. I cannot be tell you how often. There's no rule book on saying it should be so often, but you can tell the markers of when the vision needs to be refreshed. Also, it's not necessarily just one vision. There is going to be one vision in terms of that. There's not going to be division, but there's going to be many, many facets to that vision, right? So there might be an overall vision, and then there's going to be stuff within that 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 are for that time. For example, we can see that when the you know the 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 um the the black church in the UK, which really started to especially the apostolic church, which really started to take its shape in like the 60s and the 70s, right? That had to come around in part because people who came from the Caribbean weren't allowed into um you know mainstream churches. And so a lot of people began to start their own churches. A lot of I'm not saying that's the only reason. But then also with the mass immigration, a lot of people needed community. They needed a place to go to church and all that kind of thing. And so that helped to grow the black church, which is why it was a lot easier in those days for people to get saved and come to church because part of them going to church was a necessity to actually be around their own community, right? And evangelism then was a, a bit simpler. You could go and do a lot more street evangelism. The country was actually a lot more receptive to Christianity at that time. And there were so many factors that would make evangelism a bit easier. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to downplay what they did. They did a great job. But I'm saying that, that the ways that they operated then would not work now. Much of what they did then would not work now because people were some were looking for church in those days a lot of the time now if you look at a lot of um uh, and i'm just using this example a lot of young black people their parents didn't go to church their parents have no regard for church they grew up going to party they are not churched so a lot of people who were coming into church back then were church they grew up in sunday school you know and 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 so they had a background so what i'm trying to say is is that that vision that was for them is god would have given a new vision by now because the, the, the methods that they were using then won't work now. So I can't sit here and say, oh, there should be a new vision every every 20 years. But I'm sure for each generation, there is a there is a, a, a new vision or at least an adjusted vision. Has to be. Because as the scripture says, David served his own generation. My dad is not called to win my generation. So therefore, there must be a vision for my generation. So in each generation, there's got to be at least a new vision. And I can't say 
you know, who am I to say what, you know, I can't give you a year or a date, but that's a very good question. But I would say by process of reasoning, at least in every new generation, there must be a new vision. Anybody agree or disagree? Anybody experienced what I'm talking about? I know some people have, but they're not going to talk. <laughs> um, oh, okay, here's a good one. The changing demographic of your area can also cause a change in the short-term vision. A hundred percent. And we've spoken about this before. You know, when your church might have, when your church started, it might have been, you know, predominantly African and Caribbean area. I'm just using this as an example. But now it's predominantly Polish. Your vision's got to change. Because as we've spoken about, the church has to impact its surroundings, must do. So if you are actually watching what's going on in your community, then you need to start, start looking for Polish people. And what does that mean? Maybe you have to learn Polish. Maybe you have to get some Polish songbooks. You have to do some research into Poland, find out what's going on. So that's wonderful. The changing demographic of your area could also change the short-term vision or even long-term vision. Because then now, now you know your area is going to be more diverse, then you should be preparing people to reach out to more than just their own community. Go ahead, Sister Catherine. I was just going <clears> to <throat> answer your your previous question. So obviously you can have, like, just give an example of what happened. Actually, yesterday, um, Pastor spoke about vision um, for the church. But then, of course as is quite common in in most churches or a lot of churches you have departments so departments would have their vision yeah. and then of course the young people um you know they were going to reach out to their um <clears throat> generation there's probably even a couple of generations within the young people as well yeah. so each person is going to have to relate to um perhaps people of their generation in a certain way but also it's about con it's it the big issue is is not just using one method is it and just comp uh, and repeating it right um there's also it there's it's sort of broken down into um one one of the things that i think has changed a lot now is is you need to be a lot more patient and understand that people already have a lot of knowledge, spiritual knowledge, mm. of, spiritual knowledge of all over the shop. So you've got to be prepared to get into conversations with people. And you need to have a little bit of an understanding. You don't have to be an expert um, yeah. of the kinds of things that people are into in order to know how to talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah you definitely just can't go out there blindly, especially in our generation, my generation, without knowing what people are listening to, what they're taking in. Like I said, in the older generation, my dad will always be able to win people of his age group or within that age group because they're coming from the same type of background. The problem is now when he's talking to people of my generation, he has no clue what they've taken in. And they are not churched and they don't have that foundational knowledge of God that most people in his generation have. So 100% vision within each department. But um, what I'm addressing here is an overall vision. And if, the, if there's not an overall vision, that department will even be allowed to have a vision. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the youth department will say, we want to do this. And, you know, the pastor will be like, why do you want to do that? That doesn't make sense. Go and hand out flyers. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how we did it in the old day. That type of attitude kills the church. Like the, 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 whoever, is in, whoever is in leadership has to be at a place where they can not even necessarily know everything that's going on right now, but they have to put trust in those who they have established to know and to understand and to serve their generation. But, you know, as we have seen, there's sometimes a, a lot, sometimes a lack of trust between the generations. But that, that's not what I'm going to go into tonight. But yeah, 100% we need a vision. So listen to this. Oh, sorry. Proverbs 20 verse 29. And I've put here as a title, young and old. 
The glory of the younger men is their strength and the beauty of the old men is the gray head. John 2, 14, 1 John. I have written unto you fathers because you have known, that, known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and on your sons and daughters. Sorry, and your sons and daughters. Sorry. On all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. So I put here, young people are more apt to do physical work. Many of the churches we come from were started by vibrant, energetic young, young people with a vision. If those young people were wise, they took counsel from elders who had paved the way before them. The secular world has taken the counsel of scripture and created the saying, young men for war, old men and women for counsel. Every church should have a vibrant youth at its core, which is directly influenced by elders. The energy and vision of the youth needs the confirmation, direction and counsel of elders. Any vision that excludes young or old goes against the principle of God's word. God's plan does not leave out any class does not leave any class of people by the wayside. Acts 13, 36 says, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. So there has to be a, uh, a synergy and a um, relationship between young and old for any vision. And the problem we see in a lot of churches now is there's no young people in the church, so they can't even be involved in a vision. But the problem is they were never in the vision of the church, or if they were in the vision, they weren't discipled correctly or properly. And so now you, the church is just left with old people. This is what I'm talking about when the scripture says without a prophetic vision, without that, without God's plan in, uh, in the house, yeah, without that prophetic word that is given instruction and guidance for how things are to go, this is what happens. The youth start to just turn away. And every voice has, every generation has to have that prophetic voice. I've said it before. When the prophetic voice is silenced, not understood or not heard, the church dies a slow death because every generation needs that voice in it. And a lot of churches have no young people because that did the, the youth of that church, they wasn't nurtured in the way that would have kept them. Or or our sister Cameron said, or the church is just young people. Yeah. Which is the is, is the other way around, but it's still just as bad because you need both. Jeremiah 23, all right? And this is sorry. This is a, a warning to the shepherds. Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And this is why it's, it's no joke to be a pastor. You need to pray for your pastors. It's, it's, it's very serious. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I'll visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. A shepherd without a vision cannot adequate, adequately protect the flock. They cannot see where the attacks are coming from. They can't predict danger, so they cannot keep the sheep safe. This is what happens when the shepherd is irrelevant. They have no vision, and so they don't even know what Mike Todd is preaching. They don't know what these YouTube clown prophets are doing. They don't know the, the the new philosophies and the new wave that T.D. Jakes and all these people are bringing to church. So they're not even preaching against what's happening in the world. They're preaching against what's happening in 1970. Shepherd must have a vision. Shepherd uh, without vision does not feed the flock the correct food that will nourish them. And we're going to talk about it later. Babies need milk. So when, it, when, when, when you have newborn babes, they need certain food that's actually going to strengthen and nourish them. They can't take every food. So the shepherd needs to have a plan, or the shepherds, I should say, need to have a plan for, for, the, for the newborn babes. And they need to have a plan for the, for the more mature so that they could, they're not just drinking milk all the time, that they can get some meat too. 
A shepherd without a vision cannot guide the sheep to where they need to go. And in attempting to guide the sheep, blind guides, as the scripture says, they cause the sheep to scatter and they lose many. This is the importance of a God-given vision in the house and, import and the importance of leadership having and using the vision of God and not, not running on expired vision and not trying to create their own vision. We need God's vision. Otherwise, we reap the rewards of rebellion and our churches start to become places that rather than discipling people are just making uh, people ready for hell. Shutting the kingdom. This is what Jesus said. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders and hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor do you allow those who are about to go in to do so. Ye blind guides that strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. The Jews were in the habit of straining wine in order that there might be no possibility of their swallowing it, swallowing with it any unclean animal, however minute. The camel was an unclean animal to the Jews also. To strain at a gnat and swallow a camel means making a big deal out of small things while enduring bigger things. Matthew 25 to 28. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Salvation is a heart work that inevitably has bearing on the outer man. Jesus's method was to focus first on the inner man, the Pharisees placed more emphasis on appearing to be righteous than actually being righteous, and their reward for that attitude was spiritual blindness. Partaking in Christ's divine nature is a holistic experience that changes the whole man. Putting on Christ is not an event, it is a journey. As the saying goes, you can't scale a fish till you've caught it. Too many times we have been guilty of trying to do the work that only the Spirit of God can do. We need transformation, not confirmation. The problem is in some of our churches at times is that we have praised and we have elevated people who conform and we have not allowed the spirit of God to transform people. So if people look right and they sound right, it doesn't matter what's going on in their personal life. We're elevating them. They're preaching and they're leading praise and worship. But the, the thing is, is that people all the, the, the people always know what is going on with these people and so what that does is that make the church it makes the church look like it's fake and it causes church hurt it causes people to not believe the church is genuine because they're like how is that person up there preaching and doing praise and worship and i and i know what they do on the weekend the problem is right is that we need to allow the spirit to make some changes as sister Catherine, we need to be patient with people we don't need people to conform. We don't need people, oh, because you come to my church now, now you start dressing the way I told you to dress and I think you're saved. No, we need people to transform because guess what? When they're transformed, they can leave your church and they won't change. So when you see them on the street, you won't be like, oh, oh, I didn't know. Oh, hello, sister. Like you won't have to do that because they, they have been transformed. They have Christ's divine nature in them. So they understand that certain things are not appropriate. They understand it's not appropriate to talk certain ways. They understand it's not appropriate to go to certain places and to dress certain ways. But when we just want people to conform and we're not concerned about transformation, which is a part of the discipleship process, helping people to, 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 be, to have their minds renewed daily, then what we have is a church full of conformers. And eventually they leave and go to a, a church where they don't have to conform. We need transformation. And sometimes we've been guilty of being very much like the Pharisees, focusing on people's outer and not focusing on the inner. Because when the inner is changed, the outer will change. But if you change the out, it doesn't necessarily change the in. We need to do it like how Jesus did it. Focus on the heart of the person. 
when that heart is pure and tender, it will receive the doctrine and it will do, they will do what they ought to do. Okay. So we have to be careful how we treat God's people. It says here in Matthew, uh, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land, what to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more child of hell than yourselves. We can, huh, in, in saying we're doing God's work, we can make it worse. We can make it harder for people to enter the kingdom because their experience of us can be so bad that they never, ever want to go to church again. The world is full of people who are hurt by church people. Hurt by people who say they love God because of the way they were treated. Matthew 18, 1 to 6 says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus called a little child unto them and set him in the midst of them and, I, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive such a little child in my name, receive of me. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The little child represents a new convert or a young believer. To receive such a fellow believer uh, is to welcome Christ himself. Therefore, the basis of true Christian fellowship is established in Christ himself. Offences are viewed as a reality that must be accepted in the present world, but woe, the prophetic condemnation to death to the one who is the source of the offence. A millstone is literally an ass stone or a large grindstone turned by an, an ass. We have to be so careful how we're dealing with new converts and new believers because God is watching. And he said that it would be better that a millstone were hanged about his neck than we offend or than we mistreat one of these little ones. The believer in the first stage of their uh, walk is very tender and very impressionable. And so we cannot afford to allow Satan to give to, 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 to take a foothold in their life because of our behavior. We have to be careful. And I've seen it with my own eyes. And many of you might have witnessed it when new believers come in. Sometimes some people are like ravens. They just flock into this person to tell them what they need to do and how they need to live. And I'm not saying that these people don't need instruction. We're going to see that they do. But some people have gone out of their way without uh, permission from leadership to try to mold and shape these people. And I've done more damage than good. As the Bible said, made them twofold more a child of hell than, them, than themselves. We have to be careful. Churches have to be very careful with new believers. So back to the future. I'm not coming to tell you anything new tonight. I'm just coming to show you what the Bible says and compare it with some of what we are doing. Now, um, this is a great piece on evangelism and discipleship by a guy called Dallas Willard. I just edited some of what he said, but I want to read it because I, I found it so profound. And it just spoke to exactly uh, how I felt about, you know, evangelism and discipleship. Here's what it says. Much of evangelism today is rooted in a misunderstanding of salvation. People have been told they are Christians because they have confessed they believe that Jesus died for their sins. But the total package is presented in such a way that it leaves the general life untouched. Biblically, salvation means deliverance. The question is deliverance from what? The common message is deliverance from sin and guilt. But the full concept of salvation in the New Testament is deliverance from our present sins. Deliverance from sins comes from the new life of God's kingdom when we place our confidence in Jesus the person. The problem is that we have been obsessed 
with this idea that the real issue is making the cut to get to heaven. We have taken the discipleship and living kings, the king's way out of conversion. In today's presentation of the gospel, Jesus' death is primarily presented as a ransom that deals with guilt and the effects of guilt regarding our standing before God. But there is more to life than guilt. Once you have been forgiven, you still have to live. Jesus is about the redemption of actual life from actual sin. It is by entering into his life, which is still ongoing on earth, that we are delivered from actual sin. The New Testament is absolutely clear on this. You, you can just take Colossians 3 and Philippians 3 and 1 John and Titus 3. Um, they all make it clear that the righteousness which is by faith is a matter of of being delivered from the evil that is around us in action and that we are in danger of falling, falling into ourselves. Faith in the living Christ raises us above merely being delivered from the consequences of sin. We need a doctrine not only of justification but of regeneration. We need to, a picture of our life in God that does not leave most of our life untouched. The life lived and experienced by Christ's disciples will impact a dark world in need of a savior. What has happened today is that we've reduced salvation to justification. We've reduced the saving work of Christ to his death on the cross. So what relevance has the resurrected Christ? None. There is a life to be lived and the kingdom addresses all aspects of life. Too much time is spent focusing on how to escape this world rather than impact it. God has given us the power to live abundantly. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. And I found this to be profound because in a lot of these new age ministries, you can see by the way the preachers live the doctrine that they preach. And as this man is saying, they preach that, oh, because Jesus has forgiven you, that's it. There's nothing else for you to do. So you can pretty much live the way you want to live. You see it with this maverick music people. All of their lives now are starting to be exposed for the, for the sin and the nastiness that they live. But because they can produce some nice songs, people are convinced. And our young people now begin to follow these type of people and think that the salvation that they live or the life that they have or they, they, this false Jesus and this false gospel that they're following is okay. And then in many of our churches, we're just focusing on making it in. We're not trying to get people to impact now. We're just saying we just need to make it in. We just need to make it in. So then we are forgetting that. Hold on a minute. Where, where's the Christian schools? Where's the Christian education? Where's the Christian businessmen? Why are we? Why why can't we impact people other than inviting them to church? Why isn't our life outside of church the focus? So you see, there is a gospel that is being preached and a Jesus that's being preached that's not really effective because we're just preaching about what his death on the cross did, but we're not talking about what his resurrected life enabled us to do. Am I speaking to, to, to anybody tonight? Does anybody see this? Does anybody deal with young people and see that what they are dabbling in today, the form of Christianity they are dabbling in today is literally what the Bible said. It's a form of godliness. It's a, the blood of Jesus has no effect because, oh, it takes away their sin, but it doesn't now open up a new and living way for a regenerated life. Mr. Catherine, give me a thumbs up. The way modern Christianity preaches the gospel, apparently we would have gone to heaven even if Christ had never risen from the dead because the payment was made in full on the cross. At that point, we would have all gone to heaven because God could not have found anything against us. It would have all been forgiven. Nothing else would have been available to us to make us ready for heaven so that we would be comfortable when we get there. I shudder when I think of many people who are professing Christians today winding up in heaven. I don't know what's going to happen to them. I think they could not be very happy in heaven if they have not gotten acclimated here. Heaven starts now. If disciples are not living a life rooted in heaven now, 
they are disciples in name only and not in nature. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6 says, But God, who is rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved, and have raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our life right now should be rooted in heaven. So we are called to impact outside of the building so the the, the the what we are what we are preaching and what we are teaching has to have daily application it has to have and the thing is these false teachers they are actually preaching the kingdom sometimes better than us but they're preaching a, a corrupted version of the kingdom and they are drawing people into this weak christianity that they preach because the Christianity that they preach, like I said before, you're saved. So you're saved because Jesus died for your sins. And your life doesn't have to be transformed. You're not battling against current sin because the sin has already been paid for. So there's no regenerated life. We have to know what we're dealing with today. Because the hardest people to win for me, I don't think is really the, 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 the pagans. It's the Christians who have received the false gospel. Because they think they're saved already. The hardest person to, 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 to reach is someone who already thinks that they're saved. And some of our young people have taken on these doctrines and are in our houses and in our churches and are living their best sinful life but believing they're saved because the price has been paid and they don't have to live a regenerated life. They don't. It doesn't matter that they're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Their life doesn't have to reflect that discipleship the leading assumption in many churches is that you can be a christian but not a disciple that has placed a tremendous burden on a mass of christians who are not disciples we tell them to come to church to participate in our programs and to give money as if somehow they will just get it and become trained equipped and ready to do the work of the ministry but we see a church that knows nothing of commitment we have settled for the marginal, and so we carry this awful burden of trying to motivate people to do what they don't want to do. We can't think about church in the way we have been. We need to clarify in our minds what a disciple is. My definition, a disciple is a person who has decided that the most important thing in their life is to learn how to do what Jesus said to do. A disciple is not a person who has things under control or necessarily knows a lot of things, Disciples are simply people who are constantly revising their affairs to carry through on their decision to follow Jesus. I like that definition. Disciples are people who are moving everything in their life, if necessary, to do what God has called them to do. Now, when we look around our churches today, is this what we see in the pews? Are we seeing priests in the pews? Are we seeing people growing and maturing in the pews who 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 can also grow, help to grow and mature other people? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. Is and, and the thing is, I'm not placing this just on leaders. I'm talking, placing this us, on us as individuals because we should be priests in the pews. But are we? Are we doing the work of the ministry? Because it's not necessarily just about uh, you know, winning people. Yeah, some people are going to be more apt to win people than others. But when those people are inside the church now, if you are not gifted to necessarily be an evangelist, everybody has the gift of, uh, or the, the ministry of reconciliation and uh, the word of reconciliation. So if we are not necessarily the most gifted evangelist, we can still be gifted. We're still gifted to help disciple people to help in the reconciliation process. Evangelism and discipleship are two kingdom assignments of the church that work together to fulfill the master's great commission. The church cannot afford to confuse the two. Great sermons cannot compensate for a lack of teaching, training, and equipping the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry. We can no longer put preaching and conventions ahead of associative learning. Many churches 
have been imbalanced and the fruits of this imbalance can be measured by the number of priests in the pews. Disciples are not made by pulpit oratory. Disciples are developed by close association and fellowship with other members of the body. The Great Commission is given to all the body of Christ to fulfill. And so whatever methods we use, they must be the best for the weakest members, weakest church members. We have missed the pattern of God in many of our churches because people get saved and it's almost like survival of the fittest from that point. There's not really any close association. There's not really any uh, proper follow-up. And we expect people to, to take on what they need to take on from the pulpit or from attending a convention. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what the pattern we see in the Bible. And if the weakest member or the weakest new convert, if the methods that we used are not the best for that new convert, it's not a good method. Let's go further. Methods change, but principles don't. The assignment that Adam and Eve failed to fulfill was to reproduce people in God's image who would replenish, subdue, and have dominion over the earth. The principles of the method that they were given are the same principles that Jesus used and that the early church adopted. The family. The vehicle of training Adam and Eve were given was the family. Making disciples is very much like raising children. The responsibility of a parent is primarily to ensure that the helpless babe becomes a helpful adult to go from being fed to one that has the capacity to feed others. Jesus embodying all the character and nature of the father gave himself to people whom he served as a leader and encouraged them to love each other with the same familial love he showed to them. He gave special attention to three, 12 and 70, empowering them to do what he did when he was physically present with them. So now we're going to talk about close association. The pyramid system of church leadership that many churches adopted from Catholicism has made God's intention for the church near impossible to fulfill. If the church is only training a select few to fulfill the Great Commission, then it is not only falling short of its commission, but also will never be able to offer the close associative discipleship Jesus and his apostles used to grow the church in its infancy. Every home should be a church. Every man should be trained to be the pastor of his home. Every woman should be trained to be a minister to her family. And the goal of the church for every home should be that it becomes a competent discipleship center for its inhabitants. And for any external individual, such as the community or the inhabitants for influence. If this is to be achieved, then all new converts will need a strong foundation laid in their lives. Such a foundation is only achieved through close association with much personal care and attention. I saw this happen in my home church. My home church in the beginning started in my parents' basement and it grew um, from there. And what had happened was, is that the people who would be coming to the church over the next 20 or 30 years or so would most likely come through an individual or a family. And when that person came to church, they didn't need to be an organized discipleship program, so to speak, because there was Bible studies, there was prayer meetings. But then also that family or that person would usually be that person's kind of discipler. If they had any issues, any problems, they would normally stick uh, close to that family because that family won them and brought them in but when my church started had issues was was when we were winning people now who didn't have any connection with any families and they didn't necessarily have anybody who they were close to that is when the need for a purposeful discipleship program uh was needed and because over the years the church didn't adjust to the growth and to the way people were coming in. Things started to get tired and old and things started to break down. 
if we follow how Jesus did it, and if we follow his plan for the home, then when someone comes into the church who is not necessarily attached to anyone, we have a multitude of places or a multitude of people who we can send them to or we can uh, align them with who can help them. When we have active prayer meetings in homes, in our churches, in different areas, when we have people who we can trust in these homes, then it's not for the pastor to go and visit everybody's home to try and disciple them. Because this is what many of these pastors have tried to do. They've tried to be all things to all people, and it's not possible because one man cannot do that. Jesus did not try to do that. But we have to have a vision for the for the home that looks like what uh, Jesus wants because that was the original place of discipleship, the home. And so we need to turn our homes into discipleship centers. We have to send back the church to the house because it can't be done in the building. If you live 40 minutes from your church, it's going to be almost impossible for you to go to that church four or five times a week. It's just going to be too much. So I call it decentralizing the church because a lot of the reason why the church is centralized is for power and control. We need to have it so that people can meet up in the week for service in houses. Because guess what? That's where new believers are going to grow because they're going to be more comfortable. They're going to have more time to express themselves. And gifts and callings will manifest because in those smaller settings and circles, people grow quicker and they are more comfortable. But we'll get back into that later. I've jumped ahead. This is from the Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert E. Coleman. Jesus did not have the time to personally give all disciples, men or women, constant attention. He did all that he could, and this doubtless served to impress on his disciples the need for immediate personal care of new converts. But he had to devote himself primarily to the task of developing some leaders who in turn could give this kind of personal attention to others. Really, the whole problem of giving personal care to every believer is only resolved in a thorough understanding of the nature and the mission of the church. It is important here to observe that the emergence of the church principle around Jesus, whereby one believer was brought into fellowship with all others. This was the practice in a larger dimension um, of the same thing that he was doing with the 12. So when Jesus brought, people were converted and Jesus was bringing people in, they were brought into fellowship with everyone. So, so, so the follow-up could be done by the disciples. Didn't Jesus didn't have to go and follow up every individual person that was coming to him because they were brought into fellowship with everyone. Actually, it was the church that was the means of follow-up with all those who followed him. That is, the group of believers became the body of Christ and as such ministered to each other individually and collectively. Every member of the community of faith had a part to fulfill in this ministry. But this they could only do as they themselves were trained and inspired. As long as Jesus was with them in the flesh, he was the leader. But thereafter, it was necessary for those in the church to assume leadership. Again, this meant that Jesus had to train them to do it, which involved his own constant personal association with a few chosen men. I am not proposing to you that this is easy. This is going to mean much personal sacrifice on our behalf. This is going to mean that we can't live those closeted lives that we like to live where no one knows where we are. No one knows what job we do. No one knows where we live. We don't like to go to people's house. We don't like people to come to our house. All of that has to, has to stop. Because God has called us individually to play a part in the body of Christ. And if you say you win someone to Christ, will you open up your home? Once or twice a week for them, if they need, if they need to come and they need to pray or they need to, they want to ask you, will you take their phone call? Are we that concerned? Are we training people to be that concerned that you know what? You might have to sacrifice a couple of days a week to make sure that this person is okay until they get to a stage where they can, you know, be mature and handle themselves and they don't have to be reliant on you. Because it was never the job of one man to do this work. This was always the job of the body. Look at the word. Jesus was not trying to win and disciple everybody personally. That's not what he did. And unfortunately, 
And not because they're wicked or evil a lot of the time. This is what some men have done. And they've died maybe young sometimes because they've taken on the, 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 the stress and the strain that the body should have taken on their own heads. Have to do away with this system of Christianity that was not from the Bible and look in the word and see, God, you have called me as a priest also. What part can I play in the body to help the discipleship and the journey of, of someone who's coming in? What part can I play in the evangelism process? Our problem. When will the church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. Nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers do this job. Building men and women is not that easy. It requires constant personal attention, much like a father gives to his children. This is something that no organization or class can ever do. Children are not raised by proxy. The example of Jesus would teach us that it can be done only by persons staying close to whom they seek to lead. The church has obviously failed at this point and failed tragically. There is a lot of talk in church about evangelism and Christian nurture, but little concern for the personal association when it comes becomes evident that such work involves the sacrifice of personal indulgence. As I said, when we realize that building and making disciples is going to take time and maybe our personal space that's when sometimes we maybe don't want to be so involved but this work involves the sacrifice of personal indulgence of course most churches insist on bringing new members through some kind of confirmation class that usually meets an hour a week for a month or so but the rest of the time, the young convert has no contact with a definite Christian training program, except as he or she may attend the worship services of the church and the Sunday school. Unless new Christians, if indeed they are saved, have parents or friends who fill the gap in a real way, they are left entirely on their own to find solutions to innumerable practical problems confronting their lives. Any one of which could mean disaster to their new faith. With such haphazard follow-up of believers, it is no wonder that about half of those who make professions and join the church eventually fall away or lose the glow of a Christian experience, and fewer still grow in sufficient knowledge and grace to be of any real service to the kingdom. If Sunday services and membership training classes are all that a church has to develop, young converts into mature disciples, then they are defeating their own purpose by contributing to a full security. And if the new convert follows the same lazy example, it may ultimately do more harm than good. There is simply no substitute for getting with people. And it is ridiculous to imagine that anything less short of a miracle can develop strong Christian leadership. After all, if Jesus, the son of God, found it necessary to stay almost constantly with his few disciples for three years, and even one of them was lost, how can a church expect to do this job on an assembly line basis a few days out of the year? My question to us is, is when we look into our churches, and not necessarily our own churches, when we look around the kingdom of God, how many disciples do we really see? How many disciples do we see who are mature and capable of discipling others? How many people do we see that are babes but are maturing, that are that, that have a plan for their lives, that fully understand the call on God of the call of God in their lives and are comfortable with who they are in God? They understand their gift, they understand their calling, they're in the process. Because we're all in the process. So I'm not asking, are you seeing complete people? who have finished the course and run the race, I'm saying, how much people do we know can say, if we ask them, what's your gift, what's your calling, can comfortably say they know who they are in Christ and where they're going. A church full of people is not what God necessarily wants. He wants a church full of disciples, disciplined 
followers. This is why we can't get anybody in the prayer meeting. This is why when we call fasting service, no one turns up because disciples are not in the house. You've got church members. God doesn't care about church membership. He purchased the church with his blood. He wants disciples, disciplined followers, people who are willing to give it all to follow him. And I can tell you that when we look around, we can't be pleased because every prayer meeting I go to doesn't have 50% of the church membership in the prayer meeting. So that tells me something is drastically wrong. We have failed in discipleship. We have failed to fulfill the, 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 the great commission because we are not doing things in the way Jesus did them. Does anybody have any comments at this time? Before we move on. Does anybody disagree? Or agree? Nothing? Looks like I have to speak again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. There's always the prayer meeting is always wherever Christmas I've been. <laughs> it's always an issue, isn't it? You get um tend to get the same people yeah more or less but there's always a good percentage of people not there and the root i believe the root cause of that is with you know where we have failed in discipleship um and thank you for your honesty sister murray um life and the way the enemy is um is constructing the systems of this world has caused us as uh, the body of Christ to be more fractured than ever before. I'll come to you, Sister Bula. And the, what we have to recognize is, is that fellowship is so important. And it's not just important at the start of the believer's life, it's important throughout our Christian journey. And we have to actively fight against every um, feeling of, um, what is the word? Individualism. Because it's easy when times are not going well, or even when times are well, to just shut ourselves off. And Zoom and COVID has caused us to be more disparate and separate than ever before. But as I'm trying to show us today, when it comes to discipleship, close association is so necessary. But even as we continue our Christian lives, fellowship is so key. The Bible says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. The Bible says that, you know, in, 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 as the time approaches that we should be gathering together even more. We need to see each other as family. And that that doesn't happen um, just because, you know, we read the Bible and say, oh, we're family and we come to church and we sing a song and we sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God and we shake hands and we go home. This is more than just a conversation after church. We need to be involved in each other's lives. And I'm not saying that you're going to be best friends with everybody. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying there's got to be a close fellowship with other believers. You can't, you can't just be in church and there's nobody you're close with. And when you pray with people, I'm telling you, you will become close to them. When you start to pray for people's issues and you pray for their children and you pray for their problems, all of that stuff in you that is a barrier and a wall will break down. But sometimes many of us have never been brought into this kind of fellowship. So we don't even know it really exists. And this is the problem because the kingdom of God is different from the world. This is a different kind of fellowship. The Bible says encourage each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And that sounds so like, oh, you know, that's deep. This is what Jesus and his disciples were doing because they were going through some stuff. This is what the apostles were doing. This is what the early church were doing when they were being persecuted. They were finding strength from each other. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. When was it Peter was in prison and the church was praying? What do you think they was doing in the house? 
just twiddling their thumbs, just just there. They were singing, they were praying, they were fellowshipping, they were enjoying each other's company. This is something that has been lost. And we need to get it back. Because these are the things that enhance our kingdom life. Some of the blessings that we should be getting and the benefits of the kingdom we don't get because we're not in fellowship with people. And the Bible says upon unity, that's where the blessing is. That's where the blessing is commanded. So this close association is not just for new believers. This is, this is a life thing. This is a kingdom thing. We're part of the same family. We share the same blood. Sister Bula, go ahead. God bless everyone. You kind of sort of addressed what I was going to ask and, and say, because the vision or evangelism and discipleship, these kinds of things, it's becoming more and more difficult to resource. Yeah. And um, just and, and by resource, the, the the main one is manpower. So, you know, sometimes you are you, you see situations where the pastor or leaders or a small group of people really do have the vision but they really don't have the hands or the commitment or the faithfulness of people um you know it can't be one person so for example the, the you might have a pastor who does have a vision for i don't know the coalition or young people or whatever but they are old and they are not Polish, let's say, yeah. Um, but they have the vision, but they also, and they may even share it, but they just don't, you know, because we're busy or because we're not committed or whatever it is, the reasons are some of these things are just um hard to resource. And that's why even Jesus he's he said, you know, the harvest is ripe, laborers are are few, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers because um yeah it's almost as if the resource for, for some of this even when there is vision is is um um it is difficult to to come by yeah yeah when there is vision it's still difficult because we need resources and 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 this is the purpose of the study you know, some people might see it as an attack on leadership. It's not. Um, it's because we as individuals need to have a kingdom perspective. When we have a kingdom perspective as individuals, we will be more value to our churches. Even if your church or your leadership doesn't really operate in a kingdom way, you as an individual with a kingdom perspective will be of benefit. And so we all need to have a kingdom mindset. And, you know, I didn't always have a kingdom mindset and I'm not saying I've perfected the kingdom mindset, but now I understand, now I'm beginning to understand the kingdom because a lot of us have, we've ra been raised in a, I call it a church, the mindset. But when you see the purpose and the plan of God and how, how it's so bigger than our individual church and how, you know, our lives are more than going to church as in we are the church. So, every day should be church for us we are the church so we should be representing the church when you see all all of the intentions of god and the plan for us and how the kingdom is supposed to impact every every sphere of our lives just, sometimes i feel like i've wasted a lot of time and so we want to be kingdom minded people but we also want to pass on that understanding to others we want to be people who are ready to do the work. And if we can in some way, and, and we can, if we can impact our sphere of influence, we will make a difference, not just in our churches, in our communities, in our daily life. But we have to, we have to see things how God sees them. We have to understand that a lot of things that are happening in the church is not God's plan. It's not what he intended. I'm not trying to say we should cause a revolt, but we, we need to know, as I said in the early study, we need to know the pattern of God for our home, for our for our lives, for our churches. Like, what does God expect of me as an individual? And what does God expect of 
us as a people because i need you to hold me account and you need you need me to hold you accountable because because there is a vision there has to be accountability the reason why there has not been any accountability because there hasn't been a lot of vision but now we are now coming into understanding god's vision then you are able to better hold me accountable because the better you are is the better i have to be because iron sharpen of iron so the principle applied today Clearly, the policy of Jesus at this point teaches us that whatever method of follow up the church adopts, it must have as its basis a personal guardian concern for those entrusted to their care. To do otherwise is to essentially abandon new believers to the devil. Yet strangely, though, it is scarcely comprehended in practice today. Most of the evangelical evangelistic efforts of the church begin with the multitudes under the assumption that the church is qualified to preserve what good is done it's interesting that statement there because i i asked the question in one of the youtube videos some time ago in meet for men i said what would you do what would your church do if 20 men got saved next week i'm not assuming that every church couldn't handle it but let's be honest do you know 10 churches that would be able to cope with 20 new male converts? I couldn't name five. I couldn't name five because I don't see a plan for the men that are in these current churches. So we do these mass evangelism and we have these big events where we're trying to win loads of people. But if you don't have the capacity to look after those people, why would God give them to you? If you're like a basket with a hole in it, you can't keep anything. And um, Miles Monroe said it on one of his financial talks that, and it's so true, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle. So we wonder why our churches are not full. Because we are not praying towards it being full. We are not preparing for it to be full. We don't have anything in, 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 in the way of a plan or a strategy, as Catherine was saying, for these 20 young men in, in this example that would be coming in. So why would God send them to us? God is not going to give you anything you ain't preparing for. You ain't praying for these young men. You ain't creating room for these young men. You ain't creating things. You ain't creating programs or not necessarily programs, but you haven't got a, 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 a strategy to take care of these men when they come in. God is not sending them to you. And anybody you do get, you're going to ruin anyway because you can't look after them. You don't have a plan. So there must be strategy. We, God is not going to give our churches anything we're not praying for. Anything we're not preparing for. The result of these things is our spectacular emphasis on numbers of converts, candidates for baptism, and more members for the church, with little or no genuine concern manifested towards the establishment of these souls in the love and the power of God, let alone the preservation and the continuation of the work. If we focused on how we would actually make disciples, we would get more people in our churches. But our focus is not on that. Our focus is winning them. It's not on keeping them. One, one apostolic person said, he said the apostolic church will always win people, but it won't necessarily keep, it, keep them because it's one net to win, but it's another net to keep. We are very dynamic in winning people but we failed in keeping them and we failed in keeping them and making them disciples who can reproduce after their own kind help to grow babies need milk okay i think i might leave this till next week because this section yeah i'm gonna leave this till next week we have enough to to chew on today um is there any prayer requests today? I haven't asked on this. Um, I haven't asked on this study yet. Is there any prayer requests before we pray? And we're going to pray together. Any prayer requests, just drop them in the chat. Or if you want to say it openly, say it openly. But I'll give you a minute to drop these requests. Concerning this topic, by the way. For personal prayer requests, we are restarting our house to house prayer meetings this week. You can contact Sister Dion for the location of that. 
Okay, so we have one against the spirit of fear in us and in our leaders. Yes, and actually, Stabula, I'm going to ask you to explain that briefly so that we can pray into that with some uh, knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Yeah, because I think um, and there's a couple of things. I think some of this is um, unknown territory um, for us or for our leadership in, in the sense that, um, you know, a bird in hand, that kind of mentality. Mm. Um, at least we've got what we've got. So why bother really risking and going out for 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 something more, mm. and um, so this kind of risk aversion in, in when it comes to evangelism. Um, and for some of us, I think we're maybe waiting for someone else to do something mm. when the call of evangelism is actually already on our lives. Yes. And just because there isn't an evangelism ministry where you are, or there isn't a um, um, you know uh, another person with that, that precise gift or you know some 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 of us got us taught, literally telling us just go outside or just go around the corner or just do this or just do that at work or whatever and because it's just us or just because you, you know we're we're afraid so um if that is a hindrance uh, we we have to take that off and ask God just to give us that. If it's just me, Lord, I'm going, whatever it is, um, whatever the risks are, whatever the adventure is, I'm willing to embark on it in this and 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 not be afraid. And not every everywhere we go, it's always gonna work or we're gonna win. Mm. But we have to still go. And that's okay. There's places, you know, um, um, you know, Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, and he said, whoever doesn't receive yeah. this gospel, shake off the dust off your shoes and, and go back. It's all right. Yeah. But do it. Just do it. And, and um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I would like to pray about. And I want to piggyback off that and flip it around and say, also, look in your own church and look and see if there's someone who has been missed or is lost in who's been lost someone who's in the church but clearly they're lost there's not really any maybe anybody you know discipling them or they're not they're not progressing as they should see yourself if you are mature if you can feed yourself then look around because we we go to churches sometimes and there are people inside and we can see they're falling away and as you were saying, the, um, Eula, we sometimes don't think it's for us to do something. We're looking for someone else. So my part to add to that was help us to be aware of what's happening, even in close quarters. Someone maybe need to be brought into close, fel close fellowship. You might need to invite someone for dinner and ask them how they're doing or just get to know them. You know, because we, if, 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 if we see someone who needs help inside the house, because we assume everybody in church is saved and everybody's doing what, that's not the case. Some people have been baptized for years and they're not doing well. They need help. Some people just got baptized. Some people, you know, are maybe considering getting baptized. So let's also look inside the house and see if we can be of assistance to anyone. Any other prayer requests before we we all unmute and take this these prayer requests to God? None. Okay. Well, let's all unmute and let's let's all pray on these matters. So we're praying against the spirit of fear in us and in our leaders. We're praying for a sensitivity to the spirit that we will look inside our own places of worship to see if there's anybody who we can be of benefit to oh there's one more yeah <laughs> and also for the lord to really direct us to the people that are hungry 
Mm. Like, yeah. Who was a Peter? So it, it, you know, that really strategic. You know, God send us where because people are hungry, people are looking, and we don't always want to go to the place where you have to, you know, always be reasoning and two hours of debating and all that. No, yeah, like God send true. us to who is hungry, who is already desperate, who is already, you know, yeah, yeah. send us. Send us to those people. Send those people to us. Amen. Let's all unmute and let's pray. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, oh, Jesus. thank you, God, for this Bless opportunity you, to come before you in this hour you to bring matters of the kingdom that are close to your heart. Lord, we thank you, God, that you have told us for a time such as this and have brought this to our attention. Lord, we come before you today because we are in you. We know that we have an opportunity. We have given time. We have been given favor. We have been given your word to impact, oh God, our sphere of influence. Go out into the world to make this And Lord, you have called us to come to this great commission. As we come to you today, recognizing that we need your guidance. We need your guidance. I'm guilty, oh God, of not always exploiting every opportunity. Not, not always revealing the So I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for that you come into the world. I Lord, you will be our to do your will. Lord Jesus, oh God, that you will be our heart to do I am not heard from the doubt that would keep us from doing your will. Oh God, we pray for you to be so clear that you will be in leadership in every state of our position and attack on their minds. Oh God, that would cloud their vision. God, we ask for clarity in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. Lord, that you would take you take you up your work. Lord, the peace that you have given us. Lord, after the Holy Spirit came upon us, and we pray that you would be fear and doubt and fall upon our lives. So I pray, Father, that as we bring ourselves to you today, that you would hear our prayer and our prayer, that you would call us to make a sacrifice, to pay the price, to really have our eyes and our conscience open to you, oh God, your plan for us, your will for us. Oh, we want to see a change in our world. World. We want to see a change in our churches. We want to see a change in our communities and our homes. And so we are asking you, Heavenly Father, to change us first. Let the change be in us. We bring ourselves to the world. We ask to cleanse us of all our eyes. We want to bless them with us. Anything that will hinder revival, O God, purify us. O God, clean us, O God. Make us new, O God. Give us Oh God, that I might have said I'm not the Lord, that will go out into the highways and the bridges and the sea flows in the sun. We pray, God, that you will open our eyes and make us sensitive to those who are hungry for the word. Those who need, oh God, and are searching for the truth. Give us patience, oh God, and wisdom that we would, oh God, speak to them, oh God, in the of truth. We pray that you would give us peace. And the voice of the shepherd that oh God, when we speak, they will hear your voice. Everywhere on the earth, oh God, 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 oh God,
Even as you shared your lives with your Father God, we pray for your mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.